Alright, so I'm Daniel. I'm Brittany. I'm Morgan. And this is our video over how to manage auricular hematomas to prevent cauliflower ear. So to start off, this article talked about what auricular hematomas are and how the proper management can prevent a more serious condition. So the author starts by going through the, what the definition of auricular hematoma is and what sports most commonly see this condition. So an auricular hematoma occurs between the peritoneum and the cartilage of an ear and is caused by acute or repeated trauma such as rubbing, which causes the auricle to deform and also causes swelling. Then this causes the blood supply of the underlying cartilage uh, to, it disrupts that blood supply, which then causes infection and necrosis, which then leads to the deformation known as cauliflower ear. So then the author talks about the management of, the, of, how the, of that condition. So briefly that includes doing needle aspiration to drain the fluid out and then using cotton bolsters and other gauze to pad the ear and then referring the athlete or patient to an ENT for further referral. So to start off, I, I want to know what you think the responsibilities are for an AT if an athlete comes to their room with an auricular hematoma after say a wrestling match or a boxing match. Uh, well, one of the main things that the article mentioned uh, for an AT, the responsibility would be proper documentation, so documenting how the injury occurred um, and then where exactly the injury is at on the ear. So if there are like, any landmarks in here that they can um, associate the injury with where it's more severe, they're really mostly responsible for the documentation, um, being that they aren't really allowed to drain the cauliflower ear. Um, I think there's they have to have a nurse to do that. So unless you have a nurse on staff for that, um, they can't really drain it. They just have to document it for Um, going on that also to like really pinpoint kind of where the disruption is occurring to uh, the outer ear. Uh, and it's best if like they can catch it within. It talks about like within the six hour time period because if it's longer than six hours. Um, then at that point they are unable to train it, which is then when the process of formation occurs. All right. So going off what you said about the uh, AT not being allowed to to drain the fluid, you think an AT should receive the proper training so that they can aspirate a swollen ear to prevent this, or do you think that should just stay uh, for emergency nurse practitioners to be able to do that? Um, I think because that seems to be a pretty common injury um, in the sports, such as like wrestling, is really the main one that comes to my mind when you think of like college level. Um, I think that it would definitely be a benefit for them to know how to do that, just because, like I said, it seems to be a pretty common occurrence. And that way you would save the patient money from having to visit a doctor, and then you would also save time to be able to catch it within that six-hour frame. It's more likely that they would be able to get it done um, in an athletic training facility than having time to go to a doctor. As like because there are a lot of schools that um, they don't have like those other like providers that close to them. They'll be like thirty minutes away or so. I think well we have the physician uh, care center over here and then Walnut Street. But aside from that, our nearest hospitals are Columbia City, Warsaw, Wabash, and Huntington, and all of those are at least. So that also would help um, with like that time frame, especially if they're like reaching towards the end of the season as well. If it just happens in practice, you might wake up hours before they come to the AT, and then if it's a little bit drive, it becomes worse. Mm -hmm. And also, since I think ATs, they're starting to move towards letting them be able to do IVs. I think it made sense. And they should be able to aspirate in the ears, and then they do that, put some gauze on the ear. And and send the, refer the player to an ENT later, but then conditions taken care of. But at the same time, I can see like why, um, like unless the AT actually has an ENT specialist like right on call, how do you refer them to mm -hmm. one right away? Well, because it says you have to refer to once it's aspirated, you need to refer them to mm -hmm. an ENT specialist right away. Yeah. But if you don't have that connection, then would you be able to send them to the emergency room? I don't know.
know if that would be like you your best to, option. You have to know. find where you're, uh, you should know where your local ear, nose, and throat stuff is. Yeah. So and that's required even if you ask for it or a nurse ask for it, they have to see it. Mm -hmm. And that's also another thing that uh, it Bowerful talks about the athletic trainers. Uh, it's important for them to build those connections. Um, is, yeah, so it's developing collaborative relationships with ENT specialists and emergency nurses um, just to help with the process as well. So how do you think ATs, what's their role in preventing irregular hematomas so that they don't have to ask for any use? How do you think they can educate their athletes on how to prevent um, the So you kind of just said it, just education I think is the biggest thing to make sure uh, the athletes know, you know, what the repercussions can be if they don't wear their headgear, um, and just being aware that if you're in a contact sport like that, that it's pretty likely that you're going to have those injuries, especially if like, you don't wear the headgear, uh, and then what the effects could be if they don't get it treated. So if something like that does occur, um, to prevent it from becoming like permanent damage, then the athlete needs to be aware that there is around a six-hour time frame, so being able to take care of it as soon as they can. Um, or visit either the AT if they are able to drain it or they're trained, or being able to visit an ENT specialist so that they can get it taken care of. And with going on, along with the headgear, it's also important that we are making sure that the headgear is up to date, like they meet the requirements, rather than like some will like try to pass the headgear and then wear it for a long time and will have as much padding. So really just making sure those meet all requirements. Also, especially if you're athletes such as wrestlers, I know if you sleep on your side too much and move a lot in your sleep, that can also irritate it. So just make them aware of that if they're already at risk for this condition. Mm -hmm. And then, what other sports do you think are at risk more than wrestling? This condition? Um, it is mentioned in the article boxing and martial arts. Uh, do you think football maybe is moving the helmet on and off? Maybe it just I guess depends on how secure the helmet is. I know when I played my ear usually got trapped in the helmet, so that that would take a lot. I can do that. Yeah. I don't know that I can do it necessarily in other sports though. But that would be a huge issue. I don't know that is. Even with like baseball and softball that wear helmets, they usually don't complain that it would cause enough friction on them to <clears throat> yeah, um, I don't know unless, like, in, I mean, obviously in basketball it would be very common, but if for some reason you got, like, elbow in the ear or something, I don't know if something like that could, I mean, it's caused by like, friction, but I don't know if it's, like, or blunt trauma. Yeah. Or, or direct blow. And then it's not get not perform, they slide across and they have any. Yeah, it. I mean, I don't think it's, it's, it's definitely not. not as common, yeah. but I think that, like, that would be the only one that I could think of as a little bit of a stretch. But. I was like, with martial arts, it's like they don't they have a, that's where the direct flow comes into it. Mm -hmm. um. So it mentioned in the article that drainage is unlikely to be successful if the injury is more than six hours old. So what do you think important do you think that plays is on the role of the AT? Um, just being on top of situations so and knowing what's going on with your athlete and maybe checking in with them after practices to make sure that there aren't any injuries or if you know that there is an injury just to make sure you get it taken care of as soon as possible because you don't want to brush something like that off and wait till like maybe after dinner after they go shower whatever you know that you need to take care of that as soon as possible so just being um, as on top of things as you can and knowing what's going on with your athletes I think it's really important um, as far as time management goes to take care of that obviously within that six hour window. And then it talks about um, the initial treatment. The first thing you should be doing is uh, obviously taking care of the pain and then uh, adding the compression to the ear, especially ice, but to make sure you're also not uh, keeping the ice on longer than what you should be. So the 20 minutes. Also, as we said earlier, making sure they have the content information for their local ENT and possibly nurses that they're the one being able to treat them quickly. So what type of structure abnormality, abnormality do you think would predispose a patient to an irregular hematoma? Well, the note talks about it, it 
the occurs in the layer between the cartilage and then the perichondrium because the layer of fat there is so small. So what also do you think can lead to that occurring? Um, well, it also talked about that uh, babies um, with it says with the perichondritis could end up like possibly potentially getting from that. Um, in that sense, it's like you guys think about how small their ears are and like their body and, and everything's like still forming, growing, and developing. So babies are definitely at risk of it as well, especially if they're like you're not washing them carefully. Um, even the little small can possibly cause that for them. So you think the proposed treatment that the author puts forth is worth is worth the, the cost? So you have to refer and they have to have an ear aspirated, and then you, they have to do some type of injection to numb the ear. Do you think fixing that is worth the cost of all that to the athlete? Um, I would think it would just kind of depend on the severity, and it's kind of a personal preference if it's more of uh, at that point the look of it, as long as it's not causing any physical harm to the person, um, I don't think, like I said, I think that's kind of a personal preference, whether somebody, if it really bothers them or if they don't really care. I mean, I know a lot of wrestlers take to it on purpose. Yeah, like I've, I've known wrestlers to purposely hit each other in the side of the ear to try to get off our rear. So I think a lot of the time, um, it's personal preference, but as long as it's not causing any damage, I don't think it's necessary for all the expense, but if the AT could be trained to be able to do it on site, I think that, that would be worth the school expense. If that makes sense. If they would be able to train them, or it would be worth the AT's um, time and money to invest in doing something along the lines of those training. Mm -hmm. Going off, we talked about if the AT should be able to aspirate the ear. The, uh, the article mentioned going along with that. So you need to be able to inject some type of anesthetic into the ear. So do you think that's something that the AT can proceed with you in the future? You mentioned some type of lidocaine or epinephrine. They need to be able to have access to that to be able to inject that. Do you think that should be within their scope of practice? Um, personally, I don't know. I think that's maybe a little bit outside of the scope of, of an AT to be able to, to mess with the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, if it goes too deep, it could cause a cervical block and then that can mess up their, yeah. their eyes or their shoulders. I, I think that's a little bit beyond the scope at that point. Um, so then I guess I don't really know how that would work to do uh, an aspiration on site with an AT because you need somebody to do the procedure. Not that I think that's a little bit beyond the scope just because there are so many risks. Um, and obviously, an AT is not going to have the same amount or the same type of schooling as like a an AT administering anesthesia. <coughs> so, it also mentioned in the article, an emergency nurse practitioner is allowed to aspirate a hematoma that is smaller than the size of a twenty pence piece. So, just out of curiosity, I looked that up. That's about twenty point five millimeters. So just for future reference, is about. Mm -hmm. It was not very big for an EMT. So even if an AT could be an experience in doing that, they can't do much. Mm -hmm. You still have to refer to a nose and throat doctor for any severe injuries. Especially after six hours, they're probably going to need surgery and you need to for that. So what other points did you find interesting about the article or why this is important to you? Um, I mean, I thought it was interesting. I mean, I thought it was interesting as far as that babies can develop it. I know we already kind of touched on that, but really other than talking about it in the article, I've never really given that much thought, I guess, um, or heard of it. I wonder how common of an occurrence that is, just because I've not really heard of that from just personal experience with family members or whatnot. Um, so I wonder how common that that is. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I never heard of it other than Justin. I didn't know that anyone else would get it. Yeah, I didn't think about anything like that before. Uh, and I wonder if there, I mean, probably not nearly as common, but I wonder if there are other things uh, that would cause somebody to 
bad for me and help me. I was, um, uh, I've always, like, known as called by her and do, like, the direct blows. But I thought it was interesting that even the friction, like, just rubbing the ear could cause it. Um, also, the failure rate being, they say that it was high. Um, and that the procedure is off, like I said, it was performed once, but, like, you missed four million and ones. Yeah. And it doesn't work well. Yeah. Um, but I found it interesting that it was high. And at first I, like, was curious about, like, why. Um, and then, like, I remember from the beginning of the reading that it talked about, uh, it talked, it talked about the carotid artery as well. Uh, the blood supply, it talked about the blood supply. Um, they, I said through the posterior auricular and superficial jumbo arteries, both the resin from the carotid artery, which made sense as to why um, they have such a high failure rate. But you got to think also, you could cause disruption to one of the pathways in the carotid artery. So after the aspiration that you mentioned that you have to use some type of bolster, and it mentioned you use a cotton bolster, or there's some type of thermoplastic uh, splints or rubber materials or silicon that you can use, what do you think would be the best for an AT to use, or do you have a personal preference of what you would use to do with this ear? Um, I mean, I wonder if it's maybe a little bit personalized to the patient, so whatever... I, it, it's not probably going to be very comfortable because it's trying to keep the ear uh, like compressed. So it's, it is going to be uncomfortable after having any kind of an injury to it. But I don't know, maybe that would be like a preference or a preference to the patient or to the AT. As well. mm -hmm. I also think um, the cotton bolster, I feel like, it is more like um, more available to like all ATs in general. So I feel like that would be an easier or a more preferable way because it also say, said that it was it did just as well as any of the others. So what do you think is sort of the clinical bottom line that the authors find you people to take away from reading this article? Um, I would I would say just um, to be aware of you know what the role of an AT would be in some kind of situation like this so knowing um, that there isn't really a lot more that they can do other than treat the immediate symptoms like uh, the compression, the pain, and ice it. Um, and then documentation, and so just making sure that you can catch it early enough that if it needs to be treated, that it can be. Well, that's and, true. Yeah, and then just having the connections that you need to on hand because you don't want to get to that situation where you need the connections and then you don't have them. So just being prepared and kind of making a plan of action before things happen rather than after you already have the situation occurring is kind of what I got. Um, a big thing that I took from it was definitely the building the relationships with like other uh, people in other specialties. For example, this one would be the ear nose and throat specialist. Um, currently like we well the oh. athletic training students in the junior class, we are doing general general medical rotations, so we see the eye doctor, um, the dentist, we go to the Walnut Street Health uh, Care, and then the health services here. So, Is there an ear, nose, and throat specialist in the area? Um, I don't know one, like, specifically. I know at um, the Walnut Street Health Care, they have, like, they have the radiology in there, like you can get x-rays right there on site. They have the rehab center, um, but just with working with all of those different fields, it's definitely from the perspective like how athletic trainers utilize those connections and how it is important to build those relationships. Also to help make sure, at least for all colleges, that they have some type of nurse on hand. So we have a nurse, I don't know if she's trained to ask for ears. She has to be an emergency nurse practitioner. Yeah. So help making sure you have easy access to the nurse before you can refer them. Mm -hmm. And she is a, she's actually done a lot of things. She's worked in the ER. Um, yeah. It's interesting about how many 
going to her job, she had before she came here. But even with her, because she's worked so many of those, like, different, like, she's worked different uh, like, subfields of the healthcare. Um, she obviously has those connections and relationships that she can, like, call and if it, it were to occur right away. And have her there. Any other questions you have about your Alright, well I think that's all we have. Thanks for watching.